Jim was pointing out who, who he was and where he came from. And he indeed did teach at Mount Abraham for 31 years. Overall, he taught 39 years. Um, and um, he's a reenactor. Um, still in. Still in. And he has um, a wealth of knowledge that um, he shares. And it's not like he's professor know-it-all, but he just shares stuff that he knows. And it, it just really makes it interesting to be in a room with him when he's talking about things that he's passionate about. And the Revol Revolutionary War is one of those passions. And um, I, we're really fortunate to have him tonight. And uh, any other accolades you wanted to <laughs> no. talk about? I don't, I don't, I don't, no, no. You could pay me more no, money neither. next time. Uh, <laughs> it is good to have a couple of colleagues here, yourself and Brenda. And you're still teaching, I understand. <laughs> Well, yes. Well, yes, I should be too. I should too. Uh, I've been retired for, what, four or five years, something like that. And, yeah, um, one of those numbers. All of yeah. Um, the people who, who work at the school tell me I was wise to get out when I got out. But things are looking up. Uh, my name is Jim Ross. Uh, Ken has sucked through two of these already, but it doesn't hurt to re Always learn something new. Yeah. Huh? Always learn something new. Yeah, you always learn some, something new. Uh, Rick told me I would speak on uh, Vermont during the American Revolution, and there are two events <clears throat> that directly concern us. Uh, this weekend at Fort Ty, they are having a reenactment of Brown's Raids. And if you get a chance to get over to Fort High this weekend, uh, they have a number of vignettes that are very, very, very valuable for people to learn about the history of a period when the British held control of Lake Champlain. And the first part of the story is, you'll have to pardon my, my speech. Uh, I had a stroke back on the 24th of March, and uh, I am said to be 90% recovered. I have a little trouble with my balance. I have a little trouble with my speech. The rest is 100%, I can assure you, uh, <laughs> including my fastball. So <clears throat> please feel free to ask any, stop at any time and ask any question. But we're gonna start in 1776 and we're gonna look at the lake uh, and who gained control of it. So Lake Champlain and who would control it became in 76, the year, the second year of the American Revolution, um, the principal question. In 1776, England and in her rebellious colonies would engage in a great race, a race to build warships to, with which to exert mastery over Lake Champlain. This is their story. This is the story. It is early summer of 1776. Um, let's start in June. Um, the American army had been driven from Canada and the British are re-exerting their control over the St. Lawrence. Likewise, thoroughly chastened, the American army is working to strengthen their defenses at Ticonderoga. And what you see here is a picture of St. John in 1776 just a couple weeks ago, which I chose not to be part of. Uh, there was a reenactment um, at St. John um, commemorating the liberation of that uh, Canadian village from uh, at the head of the lake, the head of navigation to the north of Lake Champlain. And below is one of the American ships, uh, the Royal Savage, which will become very important later on. Uh, meanwhile, down at uh, Mount Independence, you can see the American army was digging itself in. At that time, Fort Ticonderoga was pretty much ruined. Um, it never was a stone fort as we see it today. It was always a cribbing and, and a wooden fort, which according to all of the specialists of the day, would absorb a cannonball much better than the stone, which 
we see. Um, Port Tai is a national monument, not based upon the way it looked in 1775 and 76 or even before, but based upon uh, Mr. Pell's uh, vision of the fort when he had it rebuilt in the 1930s. So what we have here, and fortunately, I am uh, vice president of the Coalition for Mount Independence. We are uh, having our book published as we speak. It will be available early next year. And in it, uh, a, a very auspicious artist, Gary Zaboli, has drawn some renditions of Fort Ticonderoga, which has drawn the air of the of the people at, uh, at Ticonderoga. Uh, but it's perfectly accurate. Uh, basically, basically, the fort was wooden and was in a state of disrepair, um, serious disrepair, as reported by John Matresser, Matresser who was the English surveyor of works, uh, the engineer in charge of the British North American continent in 1773. Uh, he surveyed Fort Ticonderoga and said it would take more work than it was worth to rebuild. Now, the French lines were much of the action that took place where Burgoyne um, took control of Fort Ticonderoga, and we'll talk about that later, um, was an extensive work that was worthy of 12,000 people alone. And there were several thousand people on Mount Independence. Those of, of you who have familiarity with Mount Independence know that it is covered with trees today, and this is what it looked like in 1776. And this is a drawing by my good friend, Ernie Haas, who the original is on display at the uh, Lake, Champlain, Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, thanks to me. And we have a blow up, which is at Mount Independence at the museum uh, at Mount Independence. How many have been to Mount Independence Museum? Um, you all have, or most of you have. Um, it's worthy of going down again. They have put a lot of work, thanks to uh, Senator Jeffords, into the trails. And last weekend, my wife and I served, how many do we serve, Linda? 60 or 70? Uh, beef and barley soup. <laughs> we were second in line of the various uh, points that Elsa Gilbertson, who was the regional director, had for people to evolve. Uh, Excuse me, evolve. Well, um, so what we have here is a picture of, of Fort Mount Independence in Fort Ticonderoga, circa 1776 in Vermont, and it's in the background. Um, all of which we know include Bristol, Bristol Cliffs is up in the northwest corner, um, and there are a couple of American ships, including the Great Bridge, so we know when that was completed. It was um, June of 1777. So this is 1777-1776. And on it, um, we see the various um, brigades. There are three brigades of American troops on Mount Independence and Catfish Bay. So any questions? The American effort was, was centered at Skeensboro, now called Whitehall. Um, we have a number of renditions of the fort of the shipyard building in the area. And you see in the map on the very right about where the British and the Americans were building. And it juxtaposed opposite ends of the lake. The lake is 115 yard, 50 miles long, has 500 miles of shoreline, and it is, is, during the American Revolution, was the principal pathway by which armies would travel. And last year, I must have mentioned this, um, as the principal highway during the French and Indian War as well. So we have a picture of, of uh, Fort. Anybody been down to Whitehall recently? They have they have a, a brand new historic site marker. Um,
what is the word? By order of Mario Carmo, who is pre <laughs> who is governor of New York today. So there is a place where you can see what what we are seeing today. Um, very well, very well um, covered by the historic site sign. Uh, well, St. John's was the center of the British effort, and this shows uh, St. John, and I think that may very well be Fort Champlain in the foreground of the larger picture at the northern end of the lake. But with one difference, England already had a navy, a huge one, uh, the largest navy that was available to anybody. Uh, 600 ships plus, and we have, what, 280, according to Donald Trump. <laughs> I think that is May. Uh, so the British had all of the advantages. Uh, they had the advantages of a fleet in the St. Lawrence, uh, ships. Um, the Americans um, appointed Benedict Arnold as their commodore, primarily because he had had a certain amount of maritime experience. And this shows a British man of war, um, a fur trade which had 800 men on board, which in itself was more than the total of all the men that were on the American fleet at the time. Um, the British had ordnance, which you see depicted at the lower right. They had ships, and this uh, shows the shipyard at Chatham near Portsmouth. Uh, um, it, it, they had all of the advantages. In fact, even one of the ships that was available to them on Lake Champlain, the Flexible, uh, was just about finished. The person said, um, the admiral in charge of the shipyard said, take it apart and number each spar, each rib, each, each plank, and have it transported to, to St. John to be put back together. And that became the Inflexible, which was one of the largest ships ever to sail Lake Champlain. It was an ocean-going frigate, uh, 20, 12 guns, I think, was total. It could have been uh, outfitted with as, as many as 28. The British had all of the advantages. Um, <clears throat> it was to be Sir Car Car Guy Carleton versus General Pendleton Arnold. And Arnold, regardless of what you think of them, if he had been killed at Saratoga at the Battle of Bemis Heights in October, uh, I can't recall what number it was, so I think it may have been the 7th of 1777, we'd be taking his birthday off. But unfortunately, the Hessian who fired at his horse and killed the horse and caused Arnold to land on his leg didn't kill him. And there were a number of doctors who wanted to amputate because that was the, the standard procedure back in the day, and Arnold would have none of it. Uh, he was a young and powerful uh, young man at the time, and he was given control of Philadelphia by, by uh, General Washington. Uh, he was one of Washington's protégés, one of his most important members of, of uh, of the American staff, and as a result, uh, he married a prominent Tory young woman uh, who was 18 at the time, Margaret Shippen, who began to work on him, telling him that the French were the evil and that the British were not that evil, and hence the selling of, of uh, West Point or the attempt to sell the plans for West Point and the consequent uh, raids along the, the southern shore of, New, of uh, Connecticut and uh, Rhode Island, and the incursion into to Virginia, which earned 
General Arnold the enmity that he has so richly deserved ever since. And I understand that the, he was buried in anonymity in a, in a churchyard in England, and it is very difficult to, to locate his grave today. He died in 1811 or so. Um, his sons went on also to be British officers. He was a British major general, or brigadier general, which was pretty high place considering, but gained none of the respect by the British officers that he should have had had he remained true to his cause. Um, what I'm going to tell you that he did at Lake Champlain and Saratoga deserve, probably for him at least, a second um, thought on our part, based You'll have to bear with me. I know what I want to say, but getting it out is very difficult. Um, if you will give Benedict Arnold his due for what he did at Belcourt Island, you will forever be in his debt. And what I have here, uh, I got to work on the Philadelphia when it was being built 24 years ago and have served up then up until this year every day um, of the summer um, putting people ill at ease about how they feel about Benedict Arnold and I can I can picture what it's like to be on board that ship 45 men and there is one of the gondolas uh, which he had 11 ships to face the British with uh, the Americans threw 410 pounds of iron and the British threw 800 plus. So the British had twice as great a fleet anyways, as the Americans did. And the very fact that, um, that his Navy was destroyed, it gave us a year to prep. And eventually, Alberton, the Americans, uh, gave a very good account of themselves. And at Saratoga, they stalled General Burgoyne cold. And when the news of that got to King Louis the Sixteenth, King Louis the Sixteenth came out of the closet and gained us the French Alliance of 1778. And with that came the United States of America. So. We owe everything to Benedict Arnold in that one year. Uh, <laughs> to the right, you see the American ship, the Philadelphia, and I helped build it. Uh, I have been, in, in fact, back last, last August, Linda, hello. Uh, I was uh, the chief gunner on board. Um, despite the fact that I wasn't able to see it up, <laughs> <laughs> At the time, I was still the chief general, and I owe a great deal to uh, Jim, uh, Captain LaRue, who was Eric Tushinik. Uh, the Americans did do did did well to have any ships at all. Building up at Skeensboro was a tremendous challenge. The British had real ships, uh, the Flexible, the Maria, the Carlton, um, all of which are depicted. The, the Rideau Thunderer, which was a 24-pounder, um, had eight 24-pounders. And if it had gotten into action that day, it would have made splits of the American Army, or, or Navy. But Arnold was prescient enough not to see under the guns of Ticonderoga and took his fleet to the northern reaches of Lake Champlain and hunted and hunted and hunted for a place which would give his ships the greatest control of the battle. And he chose Falker Island. Uh, I don't know how many of you have been by there on Route 9 l but if you have, you notice that the, that the lake provides an escape for ships that have a narrow draft. And ships that have a large draft, like the Flexible and so on, can only come in from the south. Um, the Americans, on the first day of the battle, 
of the of Belcor, which was the 13th of October, uh, the 11th of October, 1777, 1776, gave a very good account of themselves. Um, the Philadelphia, which we know most about, uh, sunk soon after about 7 p.m. Uh, it gave enough time for men to get off the ship completely. There were 44 men on board, and we have recently discovered one for the ship, the USS Spitfire, which is down in three or 400 feet of water, and only a few people know where it is. Uh, somewhere south of Skylar's Island, they tell me. They won't tell me exactly where it is. Uh, but it's deep enough so that every third year, the art and his cohorts go down to it. It takes him entire entire day to spend 15 minutes on the wreck. Uh, they go down very quickly, but they come up very slowly. Uh, the United States Na Navy is the owner of the wreck, and they tell us to leave it alone. <clears throat> and it is wise <laughs> that, 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 that they do. Um, in order to properly preserve the Spitfire, would cost a a minimum of seventy five million, and we don't have the money for that. It would it would create the need for a brand new museum. It would create the brand new uh, uh, the need for a brand new conservatory uh, located at Basin Harbor, in all probability, perhaps at Sheldon Shipyard. But uh, the things that are on that boat are priceless, and they are all as they were on the evening of the 11th of, or 12th of October, 1776, when the men jumped overboard. Uh, the Spitfire was built by a, a separate group of shipwrights, so somewhat different, uh, but it, it is a wonderful piece of living history. And I, for one, I don't know if I'll live to see it, but some will live to see it. Um, maybe it'll be Scotty, be me poor and they move the entire ship up that way. Uh, I, I don't know how they would do it, but uh, it is down 300 feet in very cold water. The only thing that Art tells me, Art Cohen, who is the retired director emeritus of the Lake Champlain Museum, is the Quahog Muscle, which is a special uh, form of, of zebra muscle, some type of muscle that is uh, specific to the Asiatic that lives very deep. And right now, we don't have anything on it. And for the longest period of time, we felt that the bottom of the lake at that depth uh, was a static environment. And we have learned that it is not static. Uh, just recently, in the space of three years, when, when um, our and his cohorts have gone down, they found the upper uh, staff several uh, hundred feet away and there are vicious currents that travel to the bottom of the lake. One year the lake was uh, covered with seaweed, the bottom, the other year it was perfectly clean. So there is a certain amount of urgency involved with this as well. So we will see where that comes. Don on it. What did I do wrong here? Bear with me. And the British had just barely gotten done with their building program. And don't forget that the Earth was going through a period known as the Little Ice Age. And during that time, um, did the peak of peeper season, um, leaf changing season, occurred around Labor Day. And by the time of October 11th or 12th, which would have been close to Columbus Day, it was uh, the equivalent of our Thanksgiving. So the, the, the ridges would have been shorn of the leaves there would have been very little color. And from what I gather, um, being a student of the battle, um, 
the day of the battle was of the perfectly blue, crystal clear day with the north wind. And the British set sail from their anchorage, which was south of St. John. And they blithely came down the lake, and Benedict Arnold had hidden his fleet uh, pretty much at anchorage across Valcor Bay. And there he waited. And sure enough, he sent the, um, the soon to be destroyed um, Royal Savage out and let it back in to the bay. And the British took the bay. And only the Carlton and Inflexible were able, and a number of the British gunboats were able to work their way up into the line. And what ensued was seven hours of living hell. Um, it is difficult to imagine a naval battle, but it was horrible beyond belief. Uh, the Americans went through 80% of their shot and powder. And that night, around 7 o'clock, um, if you wait till October, 7 o'clock was pitch black. Uh, the Philadelphia was sinking. Arnold, with a group of his captains, uh, said, let her go. And she sank with um, nobody on board that we were able to find um, in about 60 feet of water. And Colonel Hagland, who was the founder of the um, Philadelphia, lived just down the street from, in fact, I had delivered papers to he and his wife for many years. And little did I know who he was, except once every third or fourth week, I would be invited into the living room and Gladys would give me my magnificent fee of $1.50 or whatever it was for the Burlington Free Press. And there on their mantelpiece stood the same helmet that set the uh, Maritime Museum, the same diving helmet. Uh, that in 1935, Colonel Hagland went down to the peak. He and a friend, by the way, um, the pitcher of genetics, uh, went back and forth across to Falcor Bay. And he knew from reading the, all the accounts that the Philadelphia had been sunk and never found. So he went back and forth, back and forth, back and forth, until one day in the middle of August, they came up short and their grappling hook had caught the tip of the mast of the Philadelphia. So Hagelin went down, and what do you do if you're a marine salvage expert? Well, back in that day, there was no marine archaeology, and he was salvaging. So he brought it to the surface, and he had all of the technology, all of the uh, air-driven pumps that would blow up these uh, things, and up to the surface pops the building of him. Well, as soon as you bring a ship that has been underwater for hundreds of odd years to the surface, you immediately start the process of decay. And I don't know how many of you have seen the Philadelphia on display down at Smithsonian, but it is but a, a, a vestige of what it was when it came out of the water. Out of the water, it was filled with wonderful things like like Lord Canaveral looking at Duke of Thomas grave. Uh, it was filled with wonderful things, and they proceeded to flush most of them overboard. Which, in time, the divers from Lake Champlain Maritime Museum have recovered, by the way, including shoes, and cartridge boxes, and cart, uh, can of balls, and you name it. In fact, on the Philadelphia, the only thing that is of, of, of value on the ship, in terms of an artifact, is a British cannonball, a 12-pounder, that has a bottle still intact on the surface of it. And I tell the people, I tell the folks that, that the only thing on the boat that is original is that cannonball, and the rest is reproduction. And, you know, after 26 years and untold thousands of people coming on board, uh, it is, it is very difficult to get them to believe it, but it is true that it is the only thing that's available. If you have a chance to go down to the Maritime Museum and look at the things on display, they have wonderful things on display, including a, a shoe that is 
because it was under mud, is perfectly preserved, a cartridge box, uh, all of these things are perfectly preserved. And the Spitfire, which has not been touched by, by human hands anyhow, is loaded with everything on board, including spelling axes and uh, boarding axes and all kinds of things. But any, at any rate, uh, the first day of the battle, the Battle of Falkor, was a <coughs> resounding uh, loss for the British, a resounding victory for the Americans. And at that time of year, those of you who are familiar with the lake, know that we get a, a tremendous fog forming. And sure enough, uh, what does Benedict Arnold do? But he calls all of his men aboard the flagship, which is the USS Congress, and the captains repair on board, and they immediately decide that what they're going to do is they're going to try to escape. And escape meant um, rowing with muffled oar, uh, soaked in water, blankets around each oar, each, uh, what do they call them, sweep, standing oar. And the men could cough and so on. They managed to escape. Uh, they came close enough to one of the British ships that they heard a man tinkling over the side. <laughs> That's how close they came. And it was perfectly quiet. And everyone's life depended on it. In back of each ship, there was a, a, a deep barrel, uh, probably a, a spent barrel of gunpowder with a candle in it. And it was the job of the helmsman to keep that candle in sight at all times. And the only person who could see it was the person directly back. And they managed to escape. And the next morning, the, 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 the sun rose and the fog rose. About 9 o'clock, the bridge were all ready to start the engagement again. And cricket, 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 the Americans were gone. And it took them several hours to look down the lake and see down the lake there were the American ships stalled because of the absence of wind. The men were enervated. They fought all day and rode all night and they were fast asleep. And they're about uh, where the present town of Essex is was the American fleet, and the British fleet was at the northern end of Lake Champlain. So at least 12 or 13 miles, never. But the cruel nature of the wind, the wind started about 9 o'clock, and those of you who have sailed Lake Champlain know that about 9 o'clock or so, the, the, the wind picks up, and the British close the gap. And all during the second day, uh, there was a running battle. Uh, General um, Oh, I can't remember his name. You'll have to forgive me. I thought I knew all this, but um, it's a Dutch name. I know that. Help me. You can make one up since we don't know. <laughs> <laughs> it, there was, it, was a, it was a grand hope, Brenda, that someone would know. Oh. <laughs> um, at any rate, he surrendered his men aboard one of the rogue galleys, one of the larger ships. And a number of the smaller ships um, sailed right by Basin Harbor. And they made for Arms Bay, which was known before that um, at time as Ferris Bay. Today, there is the water pumping station for the Virginia Waterworks there. And these ships were, were put ashore on the third morning of the third day. Um, the British were right behind them um, at Button Bay and firing all the time. Arnold took his men off, off, off the ships as set fire to them, which gave um, rumor to the fact that he had taken the people who were um, wounded and burned them. And back in that day and age, uh, burning was a perfectly good way of, of uh, taking care of a dead body. Uh, 
and many of these been have been uh, been dead for 12 hours or so. Uh, normally they would have been thrown overboard in the cold water of Lake Champlain at the time. And Arnold and the remainder of his men, including a couple of boats, made it back to Fort uh, Crown Point. Uh, very quickly they abandoned Crown Point and headed for the guns and on the 25th of October of this year we are going to recreate that uh, at the Horseshoe Battery. Uh, my friend White uh, Manning and I and a couple others are, with us are going to bring our, our gun down and fire a couple of cannon shots. And there is a wonderful picture that is going to be in our new book on the history of Mount Independence um, showing that very, very uh, point in time uh, drawn by Gary Zomoli. And I wish I had a picture of that. I have seen a picture of it being on the board of directors. Uh, it is going to be well worth the wait. And it has been nine years in the making, but it's going to be a wonderful book. A book. Uh, why don't we take a uh, an intermission now and allow me, I hope to get the PowerPoint up for the Battle of Saratoga. Um, it is what? Now, 7.30? 28. Quarter of 8. Um, I don't know what time we have a comp uh, set for this, Rick, but uh -huh. I've given the short form of the Battle of <laughs> Valparaiso. So we'll take a brief intermission and I will attempt to put our, our <coughs> video uh, <coughs> Looks like you got the title page. I have the title page. <laughs> and I have I have boards lines available on this. Um, I I don't I don't know where the rest went. I, I have no idea. It's a good thing that that uh, Miss Bolton didn't offer me, offer me to come back. I had a whole bunch of recent research. The Win Underwood, well, recent. Studying in 1948 when he was a student at, at Middlebury College as his thesis in history wrote about the defense of Vermont in 1778 um, through 79 through 80 and my my recent group uh, is Benjamin Cooley's garrison company in Fort Ventures which is just south Fort Ventures uh, is by six, by Route 7, just south of Otter Valley Union High School. But it was, they were the unit that scavenged the Hummerton Battlefield the day after the battle and took up 68 stands of arms. But the American British, which were left on the field, um, the British, of course, and the Hessians marched on towards Castleton and then over towards uh, Skeensboro. And the bulk of the American army escaped to Manchester. And we would learn about them later on in uh, September of 1777, when they coalesced with John Stark and helped uh, win the Battle of Pennington um, in, in August. And later in 1777, in the fall, uh, they presented a barrier to Burgoyne that he never passed. And there were two battles at Saratoga, and in fact, very few people know this. Uh, the first battle uh, uh, took place, the Battle of Freeman's Farm took place on the 17th of September, and Burgoyne dug in. Uh, he was in hopes of General Howe coming north from New York, except General Howe was several hundred miles away uh, fighting the Battle of Burgoyne, uh, fighting the Battle of Brandywine Creek and the Battle of Germantown. And Burgoyne had no way of knowing this. And we, we think of, of a day and age when there wasn't any communication except spies crossing the lines. It was very difficult. Um, General Burgoyne had wagered that he would never retreat. And much to his honor, he didn't retreat a great deal, uh, but his army was captured. And back in that day and age, the person who was commander of the army got to sail home and give his uh, 
regrets to the king and parliament, and the men had to stay in Convention Army um, in Virginia for another two and a half years um, until they were exchanged at the end of the war. At any rate, the invasion of 1777, uh, the British king gained control of the lake. It cost him a year. Uh, General Guy Carrollton was removed, uh, despite having won the Battle of Lake Champlain. Uh, he was driven off the lake by a combination of bad weather. Uh, and if the ships had been allowed to freeze in, they would have been destroyed. So they were taken to St. John and moved up on stocks um, out of the water. And during the winter, the Americans um, built the bridge that connected uh, Mount Independence with Fort Ticonderoga. And there were a number of men that stayed, and you can't think of a worse fate than being caused to stay overnight, to stay over winter at Fort Ticonderoga or Mount Independence in that day and age. Uh, they were pretty much isolated. Uh, the men, uh, about 3,000 of them, uh, were down several thousand from what the, they had had in that summer. And their commander, General St. Clair, Arthur St. Clair, whom we correctly call St. Clair, because Saint was Sin. Back in those days, St. Clair means St. Clair. So I'm told. So General St. Sinclair um, had about 3,000 effectives, many of which were affected by uh, smallpox. They built the floating bridge by building the caissons um, out of Elmwood, uh, right on the ice, and sinking them through the ice. And there's quite a little bit of controversy about that, how that was done. Whether in March they allowed the sun beating upon the elm branches, trunks, to work their way down through the ice, or they cut the ice and built the, 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 the various, we don't know. Uh, it was such a common thing that wasn't recorded. And the way that Gary Zaboli has depicted it, uh, myself and Ron Morgan took pictures of the area between Fort Ty and Mount Independence. And we know there were 20, 23 some odd caissons, uh, many of which had been struck by various boats. And each year we get one or two uh, logs washed up ashore. And there are various logs at Fort um, Ticonderoga. There's one at Ticonderoga, there's one at Mount Independence, there's one. A, a giant one at the Maritime Museum, and they are all chopped with, you can see the axe marks still in them, and it, these are 250 years old. Incredible. But they were built much like pyramids loaded with rocks, and today all that is left is a few of the stones, uh, a few of the uh, logs, and a pile of stones. And at low water, which we are experiencing in Fort Ticonderoga, uh, it is problematic. You, you, you see the, 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 the tops of the mounds of stones sticking out of the water in various places, and it's very problematic. Um, I have an account of John Ennis, who was a British ensign of the 29th Foot, which I used to, I started and for 19 years ran, um, the 29th had a whaleboat that stuck on one of these cribbings. And the, the, when the, um, the British left in November of 1777, only to return in 1771, they burned the bridge. And they left the caisson still attacked. So they're still there underwater. And uh, the divers from the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum have mapped each of the caissons. So the, the, the bridge is still there. 
uh, much of the superstructure has disappeared, uh, been burned and been used by various people, but the stones are still there. And when you get down 12 or 15 feet, the cribbing is still there too. Um, each year, the boats traveling back and forth disturb a couple of them and they wash ashore. And that's how we know of how the, the, the men cut the, 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 the elm trees. And where they got them from is a good question because I showed you a picture of, of uh, Mount Independence that was perfectly bald, uh, probably to the south somewhere. And they were hauled by oxen that is uh, when they could um, serve as beasts of burden, they were used, utilized, and as soon as they became late, they were eaten. And we, we have uh, archaeological evidence of a great deal of, of uh, bones by the... So who was John Burgoyne? Uh, he published a book, Thoughts on the War from the side of Canada. And he gave a copy to the king, and the king said, this will work, by God, this will work. And what he intended to do was to run a series of fortifications up the Hudson along Lake Champlain and cut New England off from the remainder of the 13 rebellious colonies. And in 1776, Brigoyne persuaded King George to accept his plan. And, and uh, King George um, sent a letter to Lord Germain uh, sacking Sir Guy Carleton, who later on became uh, uh, eventually uh, governor of Canada. Uh, but at that time, Burgoyne was given complete control of, of this command. What they didn't do was relieve General Howe at the same time, and Howe was given an independent command in New York. He left General Clinton behind, and so it's a three-pronged invasion. And part of it was to come, the intention was part of it was to come down Lake Champlain and let the lead be going. And uh, Howe would come up from New York City, bound for Albany. And coming down from Fort Oswego would be Barry St. Ledger. And the three pound attack was to be at Albany. What a perfect plan. What a perfect plan. Only one prong worked. Uh, Benedict Arnold managed to buffalo Barry St. Ledger after the uh, Battle of Aristide into believing that his attack would never work. That prong never uh, materialized. The furthest north that Henry Clinton got was the heights of, of uh, West Point. And Burgoyne was left high and dry at Bemis Heights uh, with two redoubts, two huge redoubts. If you go down to Saratoga, you see the Germans were on the left, um, and that was their position. The British were on the right, which was the position of honor, and the Americans under Taddeus Kosciuszko had put a series of entrenchments along Bemis Heights that no army, no army of the 18th century could break through. Well, <clears throat> it got to be September and October. And you had about a month, the trees were already changing. The trees had already dropped their, their uh, leaves. And Burgoyne says, it's now or never, I must get to Albany, I must get to Albany. Albany was only eight miles to the south. And could he have made it? Sure. At the Battle of Freeman's Farm, um, he didn't make it, he dug in. At the Battle, Battle of Bemis Heights, he set out a strong reconnaissance and what what was his term? Reconnaissance and force. And the men or the, his, his men were to forage the crops that were in the fields at the time. 
And Betty Arnold was at the time and gross in a giant argument with Rachel Gates was the commander. And Arnold, without Gates's permission, took command of the of the American troops, uh, Learned Corps and Poor's Corps, and led them in furious charges against the British uh, redoubts. Uh, they <coughs> managed to break through the Hessian redoubt on the left, um, and Burgoyne had no choice but to begin his retreat. And he made his far to water about eight miles to the north, and he was forced to surrender his entire army out, all 9,000 men. And the Americans at that time measured uh, probably 17,000 somewhere, uh, primarily because of the French and Indian War, because of the concern of the, uh, the British uh, had used uh, Indians as, uh, what would you call them today, special operators, uh, um, reconnaissance uh, force. And the, the, all over New England, thousands upon thousands of men. Uh, the Americans who were present at the surrender were written about at home by British officers as all of them were six feet tall and many of them were six feet and were physical specimens and they were compared to the typical British soldier which was five foot five and the dregs of British society uh, it was it was quite a, dis, a destruction um, by 1777 by October and the Americans laid had the weapons many of which are at Ticonderoga in the museum by the way um, were dispersed throughout New England and even today come uh, occasionally we find them with the British regiments listed on the tops uh, some of them stuffed in attics, some of them stuffed in, in the barns. Uh, in Massachusetts particularly, we, we come across, across these weapons that were uh, surrendered at Stillwater. Uh, the British marched off to Boston. And Congress, as Congress is wont to do, even today, uh, reverts itself many times and sent the men into uh, prison, prison of worship um, at Winchester, Virginia, and the officers got to go home, go home if they promised never to raise their hand against the American Congress. And many of them raised their hand but behind their backs. They had that. So uh, it's getting on to 8 o'clock. I've spoken for an hour. I ap deeply apologize for the uh, mis misstep we had with our. I thought our, our, uh, our, what do you call it, flash drives were perfectly matched. I took everyone's word for it, including Chris and Bolton's. But that is a little bit about Vermont, and I can feel I have enormous knowledge in that area. So I'll open it to questions, and we'll take 15 minutes. What time do we have, sir? As long as you want. As long as I want, as long as you want, as long as you want. So, I'm at your service. Do we have any, yeah. any ideas about people from Bristol who served in the Revolutionary War? Uh, at that time, it was called Pocock, right. and it wasn't. It wasn't Bristol. There were probably a few, uh, probably ten or fifteen, that served in various regiments. Um, we portray later in the war. Uh, 1780, uh, Benjamin Cooley's company of Ebenezer Allen Regiment. And Vermont at that time was a separate <clears throat> republic uh, for 14 years. So we had our own army, uh, probably numbering four or five hundred. Uh, there must have been some numbers uh, from Bristol, from Pocock at that time that, that served for a period of six or seven weeks at any rate. So, yeah, can you have a question? You had mentioned when, when Arnold got his men into Arnold's Bay, uh, I, I had thought that he unloaded a considerable number of wounded people as well as he dead people. He took all the men who were, who were 
able to be moved. Uh, the, 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 the ones that were, the ones that were, were unable, to, unable to, to move were left at Square Ferris's cabin, which was up above. And the only bodies which were on the ships that, that were burned were dead already. Uh, and they didn't have a whole lot of time uh, to have a formal burial. Now, the British immediately claimed that Arnold uh, blew up his ships with the wounded aboard. There's no evidence of that whatsoever. Um, the men made their way back to Crown Point within a couple hours, and within a few, uh, within a day, they, did, they had escaped under the guns of Dicon Road, which was perfectly safe um, for them. Um, the British came as far south as Watch Point, and our depiction under Garrett's bully is the attempt of General Carlton to force the American defenses at Fort Ticonderoga, and they weren't able to do it. Um, there was uh, too much cannon, and they had to wait until Burgoyne came down with a formal siege. He had 141 uh, pieces of siege artillery with him. An uh, enormous number of horses were required that were driven down the west side of the lake. Um, what they didn't know was St. Clair had a terrible problem with camp fever and smallpox and had about 2,000 effectives to cover an area which would have, under the best of circumstances, required 12,000, which he had during the summer of 1776. But in uh, 1777, he didn't have them. So uh, St. Clair was court-martialed uh, after the Battle of, of uh, Chittagong and, and, and was exonerated. Uh, he showed good judgment, and it probably helped that uh, Burgoyne's army was at that time captured. Uh, but it's hard to hard to imprison a winner, and that's what St. Clair was. He was a winner. So he, he showed a remarkable presence. Uh, the British officers had it in their mind that the Americans were all platoons, and the Battle of Hubbardson told them far different, that among the Americans were many members who had served as, as uh, members of the French and Indian uh, battalions, and uh, there was no love loss. And they, they, they showed uh, remarkable remarkable effect of, of a small, but Doc Claris, for example, had his coat, I think, punched 40 times. And you don't get that by musket balls, you get that by, by buckshot. And uh, they said his coat was punctured several dozen times. Well, we know what that was. Yes, sir. I wonder, um, after the guns from Ticonderoga were taken down to Boston by Knox, yeah. how many were left in the well, ruins? Uh, the, the, the guns of Ticonderoga and Crown Point were taken down to, uh, how many were left? Uh, the people who founded the noble train of artillery took the best pieces, in other words, the pieces they could carry. Uh, the heavier pieces were left at Fort uh, Ticonderoga and Fort uh, Crown Point, and we're still there later on in the Revolution. Uh, but the best pieces were taken with them to Dorchester Heights, which allowed for the uh, evacuation in March of 16th, St. Patrick's Day of 1776, by General Howe, and went to Halifax, by the way. Did that answer your question? I, I don't know if, what your question was, but. Oh, so the so the forces that were then at uh, Mount Independence, did they bring that much artillery with them, which would be hard no. through the or just no. used what was no they they, they there was plenty available at uh, so. well, there was enough to arm the fleet and the the the, uh, uh, the take the Philadelphia we had Swedish guns aboard it. Uh, a 12 pounder and about two nine pounders. They were all Swedish guns captured in the 1690s. So, and at that time there was no way of telling how many times guns were fired. Uh, the Jersey 
had a gun completely disassemble itself coming to the gun crew. And you can imagine what that did to the gun crew. Today, with modern um, photography, we could see a gun be fired. And like a python, it, there is a wave that goes down through it. And if you've ever taken a paper clip and moved it back and forth, you know that it's a certain number of times that you can do it before it busts. Well, a cannon's very similar. Every time it's fired, it loses a certain amount of its, uh, what do you want to call it? Strength. In, internal structure, uh, strength. Eventually, it'll, it'll fail. And there's no way of telling. Uh, most of the guns that were used by the British were captured lower gun deck guns. Uh, 12 pounders, 32 pounders, or some at Fort Hector that have never left the place. That, uh, Jim, I have a question. Yeah. If I wanted to know more about what life was like at that point in time, and the, through the whole... It was short, <laughs> mean. Yes, where would you find it? Where would I find that? Because it seems that if you talk about battles and you talk about all these people moving around and stuff, there are people that must have kept diaries. And there are a lot of diaries that have surfaced in recent years. Uh, we, we have letters. Um, Van Independence, for example, letters that were sent by the officers who were mainly educated people who were able to write. And they talked about life and what they ate. Uh, military life is, has not changed a great deal. It hasn't changed a great deal. Uh, there was a great deal of sickness because the grounds had been for thousands of years grown up and they were disturbing the fort stuff, the, the leaf material. Uh, what I refer to, in fact, we talked about this, my wife and I have talked about this for, with folks. They boiled everything and they didn't know why it worked, but it's quite simple. Uh, the beef and barley soup we had uh, that we gave out more than 60 bowls full uh, had been sterilized and they boiled everything and to a fault. Uh, there was a great deal of fishing that went on. Uh, uh, where would you find us out? Um, and you can ask Elsa Gilbertson, you can go down to the Mount Independence uh, um, Museum. Uh, you can ask any reenactor, we'd be happy to tell you about what we've learned in 40 years. Um, what, we've, what we've learned is that these were young men that uh, didn't clean their, their clothing and didn't clean themselves and didn't clean their utensils. But their food was well boiled. <laughs> so many of them did very well, but some of them got sick and many of them died. And uh, the whole of the mount is a cemetery. And they, they didn't manage to bury people more than 15 inches. And a friend of mine, Mike, Mike, Bar Mike Barbieri, uh, did a dig with, with Dr. Starbuck that said that it all around the area where the Star Fort was on the height of Mount Independence are hundreds of bodies. Down in East Creek, there are thousands of bodies. And they don't talk about that, but the soil is rich by the many <laughs> <laughs> Ken? I, I can think of an example of what it was like for the common soldier, because uh, the family, our family history is that uh, our ancestors lived up in Franklin, Vermont, which is on the Canadian border. Yeah, yeah. And he was mustered out of the army at Yorktown, which is what, October? October of 1781. And he walked home. Which well, is probably the common thing for the soldiers of those days. They didn't have any money. Everyone for... rode Shakespeare a lot. Uh, uh, a road in those days, in those in that day and age, we would consider a path. Uh, a, a road, per se, was uh, one rod wide, with stumps more than twenty-four inches high, were cut down to eighteen inches. In 18, 19, 20 inches was roughly the height of an axle of an ox cart. 
So you had oxen weaving their way through the, the uh, tree trunks and the wagon wheels were tall enough to make it through the, the road. So over time, uh, they built the road on side hills so you would carve part of the upper portion, the lower portion, and you look at where, uh, uh, I know this because I was just the other day traveling the Basin Harbor Road in uh, Orwell and Bridport, and it, it, it went all the way up to Basin Harbor. And on the side hills, even today, it is carved out because they had no heavy equipment back in that day. We used to call them Dugways. Yeah, Dugways, yeah, yeah. I apologize. Rick, I, don't need to apologize. I, I apologize. I thought I was prepared for this and I wasn't prepared, but um, we're all old timers and we're all interested in history, so you got the best of me. You know, Jim, you did a nice job just being Jim. Telling yeah, just being here, of course, it was remarkable. Am I running there right? Well, no. Just being here was remarkable. And I'm about 90%. I hope you have been a year, and I'll be back next fall with, the, with more of the American Revolution in Vermont. And there was a lot more. There was the early war and the late war. I covered the Battle of, of Falcor and the Battle of Saratoga, which was the principal. So uh, I've learned a lot about what went on after the Battle of Saratoga here in Vermont, uh, how the Republic of Vermont defended itself and our militia group, which is the lowest of the low, uh, it's a good group of, of uh, reenactors, and I, 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 I hope you will have the opportunity to venture down to Mount Independence again. Uh, every year we gain new stuff that has come out of the uh, well, I don't know how to say it. The internet provides us a great deal of, of information, and you would be surprised how much has been digital, digitalized, a great deal. And I better quit while I'm ahead. <laughs> I better quit while I'm ahead. Thank you, Jim. Thank, Thank you very much.